Many people ask me what an isotope is, and it's not the easiest of questions to answer, but I explain it um, by thinking of a bowling alley. Now, if you go to a bowling alley, there are bowling balls that have different mass weights, but they all do the same job. So if you think of the bowling balls as an element, like oxygen or strontium, which are the elements that we use, then they all do the same job, but they have slight variations, which are due to their different weights, and those are the isotopes. So if you were to walk into a bowling alley and suddenly notice that the only bowling balls that had been used that day were the lightest weight ones, you might ask yourself, well, what would cause that? What would cause only the light bowling balls to be used? What has fractionated the light bowling balls from the heavy ones? And you might come up with a hypothesis that perhaps a party of small children had been in. Something, somebody that could only lift those light ones. So you could test your hypothesis by putting all the bowling balls back on the back wall in a tidy manner and then getting a party of kids in and, and seeing if that was true. And if that was the case, that after your experiment, only the light bowling balls had been used and fractionated, you, you have an interpretation of that particular activity. And you can go to other bowling alleys and you can assess. You can say, hmm, looks like you've had a party of children in. Or you might notice the reverse, that only the heavy bowling balls have been in, and you could extrapolate your hypothesis and suggest that maybe a bunch of lads have been in, or the army, or, or somebody would only consider using the heaviest bowling balls. And in that way, you can develop a method of understanding what has happened in the bowling alley through the distribution or fractionation of the bowling balls. And that is essentially how stable isotopes works. But there's another aspect, which is that sometimes one um, isotope of an element will increase through time. So imagine, for instance, that the manager of the bowling alley every year, and only once a year, bought a pink bowling ball and put it on the shelf. If you go to a bowling alley and you see that there are 20 pink bowling balls, you can immediately say, this bowling alley's been around for 20 years. And you can go to another one, and there are only two pink bowling balls, and you go, much younger uh, bowling alley, it's only got two, it's only been around for two years. And in that way, we, that's the way basically we date rocks. So if you go to an area where you have very old rocks, you will find you've got a very different proportion of the isotope that accumulates through time. In other words, you have a higher strontium-87-86 ratio. And if we combine the use of oxygen isotopes and strontium isotopes, which we do commonly when we analyze human teeth, then what that enables us to do is to suggest, for instance, that um, we can understand where the oxygen isotopes vary in the world uh, for instance, there's a big difference between the rainwater that you get in the equator and the equatorial regions with that that you get in the polar regions. And we can look at the strontium isotopes and understand whether people were living on very old land or very new land. Um, and therefore, we can map out where people spent their childhood. Now, we, we take the isotopes, we get that isotope into our tooth enamel, either through what we eat or what we drink. The oxygen tends to come through the water we drink, and the strontium comes from the soil into the plants and then into our diet. And so we have this two-way system of um, being able to map out where people have come from based on the isotope composition of their teeth. 